obstacle hurdle to take before uh, the really important event and that's the after party of course we're all looking forward to it beautiful lineup of uh, speakers uh, especially Gert Jan who's really uh, a revolutionary idea about food and um, I want to tell you something what you know they asked me Hans can you present can you do the presentation about food trends or whatever and I was thinking and they are asking me well you got to present one big idea you know and I got a lot of big dreams so I had to pick one and it wasn't easy it wasn't easy but I got one because I wanted it to make more personal because I'm you know my work my, my, my work brings me everywhere I'm traveling a lot around the world, doing and visiting a lot of places, uh, just to look for new food concepts and new restaurants and new hotels and new bars and new drinks. And that's called a job, by the way. <laughs> that's one of the greatest jobs you can ever imagine. For example, I, I, I just came back from a trip to uh, a couple of weeks ago from, from Vegas, Seattle to Vancouver. And, and it's so interesting to see what's happening in, in, in my world of food. So I'm specialized in, in food service. I'm looking to restaurants and what are the chefs doing? How do they think about food? How do they innovate their dishes? What are the entrepreneurs doing? You know, what kind of food concepts are they making? And all these trends which they establish will eventually round up in the supermarket. Yeah? The trends are set in food service. And you have great trends, but you got also a lot of stupid trends. So I was in Vegas, which is a wonderful city, great city, for 48 hours, no longer. Then you got to leave that town, man. Poor, everything lost. And I was there, I, uh, I had asked me for a presentation about food trends, so I did it. But I had some uh, time left, and I wanted to see one special concept. And that concept was called the Heart Attack Grill. You know that one? You heard of that one? Perhaps the heart attack grill. Great story, lousy food. That's, that's that concept. And they treat you like a patient. So when you come in, your blood pressure is taken by a nurse. She's warning you outside. You got a lot of warnings. Don't go in here. People who weigh more than 150 kilos can have a free meal. They're saying, all successfully fighting anorexia for more than five years now. <laughs> and then you look at the menu, and I ordered a triple bypass burger, they call it. <laughs> triple bypass burger, that's something, you know. And no Diet Cokes or something, full sugared soft drinks. And the French fries, all animal fat and that kind of stuff. And the burger came in, and the nurse brought me one. And you know the size of a burger, then a normal burger, like a, a famous Big Mac is this one, but this was a triple buy best burger. And this was this one. And it was 8,000 calories. <laughs> and when you eat that one, you get it for free. So I looked at it. We had photos, film, everything. I think, what the hell I'm doing here? You know, great story, but the food. I, I mean, if there is a gastronomical inferno or something, this must be the place, you know. <laughs> if I die and someone is pissed off, you know, at me, I will end up here, you know, eating this food. That's one thing. So I, I, I flew over to, uh, I ended up in uh, Vancouver, great city, city of glass. And I took a plane, which was, uh, you know, can land on the water. And I flew to Cowichan Bay, which is a tiny place at uh, Vancouver Island. And that was the first slow city of Canada and Northern America. A slow city, you know, all know the concept of slow food, perhaps. And slow food, where uh, local producers who produce real food in an organic, sustainable way, uh, which uh, great taste. Well, that movement 
uh, has broadened its horizons and they said, well, there are also slow villages. Slow villages. And the people, three or four thousand people were living there and they have decided not to plant any fast food concept in their community. Nothing at all. And they have a vision together. And I said, well, I see everybody striving for more, yeah, more money, faster living, that kind of stuff. We don't need it. We want to do it different. So they opened a bakery with a local produced uh, bread, with local producers who are delivering the grain. They have their own fish store of a fisherman who, uh, who caught fish for over 30 years in a very sustainable way. He opened now a shop and it's becoming a new community. A new community. And that's one of the things, thoughts, insights, ideas I want to get across. That I see a lot of restaurants, concepts and food concepts which are building real communities in this age of technology. So I'm traveling a lot with my colleagues and these are the trends we see. And you know, fast and slow and casualization, health choice, veggies, of course, vegetables are real hot now because of the footprint of, uh, of, of, of meat. As an alternative, the big chefs in the world. I had a conference yesterday in Zwolle and I had an interview on the same stage with six three-star Michelin star chefs. And they're all into veggies because it's great taste. Part-time veggies, you know, raw food, everything. But they asked me, Hans, please, what is your one big idea? What's your one big idea? So I can talk uh, for an hour or an hour and a half about food trends. But I said, what's your big idea? So I had to look into myself and wondered, you know, what is my driving force? Why, why am I traveling? Why, why do, why, why I do try to inspire the people who inspire me so much? The entrepreneurs, the chefs and everything else. Okay, this is the world we're living in. 24-7 connected, high pace, no time, just work, even during vacations, urbanization. People are living in cities and more and more and more. And are they happy? There was a presentation about a gap of generations because of technology. Well, sometimes I feel a gap inside myself because of the high paced tempo of modern living. And this is sometimes the image I'm longing for, you know, the image of rest, calmness, peace. And I think a lot of people, modern people feel that. Modern people feel that. And entrepreneurs in food are trying to solve that problem in a better way than it used to be. There's a big thinker in New York. His name is Michael Pollan. Perhaps you heard of him. He's a food writer, food critic, food philosopher. And he said the last 10,000 years, no, the last 50 years, he said, our food has changed more than 10,000 years before. And don't buy anything in the supermarket your granny wouldn't recognize. And eat vegetables, he said. A lot of vegetables. Because when I was in the States, a research showed that in 2020 or 2025, more than 40% of the people in the US will be obese. So that's a big problem. And we got to solve that problem. A lot of entrepreneurs and chefs are thinking, how can we solve that in a better way? There's the big trend, the big trend is FLOSS, F-L-O-S-S. That's fresh, local, organic, seasonable, and sustainable. And a lot of chefs and food concepts are trying to work in that philosophy. So that's trends. But I was not asked to talk about trends. So I was, uh, I was in Madrid. And I'm standing here in that beautiful tapas, one of the oldest tapas bars. And um, I was thinking and having a cerveza and a jamón. A lot of jamón in Spain. Beautiful jamón. And sometimes when you travel, you know, sometimes when you travel, your memory starts to activate and I was transported in time to my childhood, to my childhood. And now here it's become personal. Now it's becoming personal. Because I'm gonna share you a little story about when I was eight years old, that's a long time ago. I was born in 59 or something, yeah. I'm 53 right now. I'm eight years old, 
My father and my mother are living in a village called Haastrecht. It's a little village here in the west of Holland. 3,000 people were living there. And there was a cafe. There was a local bar, which was called Huis den Hoek, House on the Corner. And you know what? It was situated on a corner. So that's, uh, you know, they had no difficulties with naming in those days. It was just, you know, House on the Corner. And they had a barkeeper. And the barkeeper was called Uncle Neo. It was not my uncle, because it was everybody's uncle. He was the pub owner of a village, you know, a village pub. And my father and my mother were on a Sunday. They worked six days a week, of course. And on a Sunday, it was a little bit of party. They went to the soccer game. And after the soccer game, they saw the other people in the village in the bar. And then what happened? I was eight years old. They put me under the pool table. They gave me something to eat. Sometimes they threw a dime, you know, where I could uh, do, do it in the jukebox and play some songs. And I looked at the people and what I saw was an intensified form of living. They laughed, sometimes they cried, they talked, they shared emotions. They talked about politics, soccer. They were talked about the people who died, the people who were born. They danced. They quarreled sometimes, a lot of gossip, of course. And I was looking into that as a child and I was thinking, wow, what's happening here? I'm totally amazed. And all the emotions, it really amazed me. I was astonished. You know, I was working, I'm 15 years old now, 16 officially, because I was 15 already when I was as a, you know, a young boy in that bar. 16, all right, that's official, the official age. So I was working, and I was working for three guilders an hour, and I was doing something, wrapping up potatoes or something. And I did that for two hours every night. And then I biked back to my home, but I had to pass the bar, a little cafe, that same cafe, House of the Corner. And it was so inviting. It was so wonderful. So I had to stop the bike, and I bought a beer in the bar, in that cafe. And I bought another one, of course. And in the end, I earned six uh, guilders, but you have to pay eight. So that's a problem, isn't it? Especially when you like to do that. Especially when you like to do that. So I did it a lot of times. And then suddenly, I decided not to come at that pub anymore because I couldn't pay the bill. I couldn't pay the bill. And what did that entrepreneur, that pub owner do? That Uncle Neo. Did he call my parents? No, he did not. Did he call me? No, he did not. He just waited. He just waited. And after a year, I had the money. I worked and worked and worked. I had the money. I remember it was on a Tuesday morning. And I went into the pub and I said to Uncle Neo, Uncle Neo, I wasn't, he hasn't seen me in a year. I said, hey, good morning. He said, hey, good morning. Nice to see you again. And I said, well, Uncle Dio, I think uh, I've got something to pay. Well, let me look into the big book, he said. He had a big book, you know, big book where the people, you know, where he used the, uh, had to pay the money. His book, yeah, that's correct. He said, well, Hans, that is uh, 235 euros, you know, euros. So I put the wallet, paid, feel me like a man. And he said to me, well, Hans, thank you. I trusted you. I knew as soon you had the money, you would gonna pay. And you know what happened to me? That was a statement of trust. That was an emotional bond. That was a new hero in my life. And from that feeling, that very hospitality feeling, well, this is an eternal value in hospitality of people who are not thinking in money. You have a kind of educational look at their financial management. That is what you can say. They have patience. They love their customers. They love their guests. And from that passion, they serve you every day. And those people are telling, well, you're a man. You got human needs. And we can talk about technology, which is important, which will change the world. But they are not the champions in high tech. They are the champions in high touch. 
They are the people who reach you. They are the people who touch you with food, with hospitality. You know, and on, during my travels, I see those people, I try to inspire them, give them back what they gave to me. And that's the message I want to get across to all those people who are working in the service industry and you bring your dishes, and perhaps they're pouring their coffee and your wine in a moment. And they're not getting paid a lot, no. And they try to help you out in a good way. And that's also the business of food and food service. And my only message to you, if that happens, please do this one. The light will open up. If you're open to communicate and you have that feeling of hospitality and you know that feeding egos is just as important as filling a stomach when you go in a restaurant and when you know you've got to do with people who are thinking, well, I don't care how much you know, I want to know how much you care. Do this, a small message for a big world, be humble, please, be hospitable and be grateful to the people who serve you. Thank you.